So in the, this video is all about the odometer test and how we use the odometer test um, to calculate consolidation parameters for soils. So an odometer it looks like this, where we have a, um, an odometer cell, um, and within that cell we have a confining ring. So when we're talking about an odometer test, we're talking about um, a confined consolidation within soils. We have a confining ring, and within that confining ring, we put our, our, our sample of soil. Um, we should note that it's best to use a, an undisturbed sample of soil in your consolidation, in your odometer test. Um, if you uh, remould the soil, if we, we disturb it, we change some of that structure that clay soils have, um, and it might give us a different um, consolidation parameter than what might be expected in situ. So we best use an disturbed samples of soil for an odometer test. So your soil sample sits in the middle of your confining ring um, and on the outside of the odometer cell there's room for some water um, and that make, keeps our sample fully saturated during the test. So we put some water into the outside of the confining ring, uh, outside of the odometer cell. So we stick the odometer cell into a loading rig um, and we put a cap onto the top of our soil um, and on top of that cap, we suspend our load. Um, and what we measure is the displacement of the cap or the settlement of the soil uh, during the test. So uh, this is what an odometer looks like in cartoon in profile. You see that we have our um, odometer cell in the middle here. Um, and sitting within the center of that cell is a, is a sample. Um, uh, that, that sits within a confining ring. Um, on the top of the sample and bottom of the sample, we have porous disks, and that lets water permeate in and out of the sample. Um, around the outside of the cell, we have water um, and a loading cap. And now mass is um, applied, or load is applied, onto the top of that loading cap through this rig, where we have a, a loading arm. Um, at the end of the loading arm, we suspend some masses, and that loading arm is attached to the, the lid of the box. So you can see within this odometer test, how load is applied to the, the sample. So we stick our sample into the uh, loading frame and we know the initial thickness of that sample. So we can plot a graph over time of how that sample thickness changes as we load our sample. So we stick our first load, so this is time. We can draw a graph here with time and sample thickness. And that has an initial sample thickness that we know. Now we stick a mass onto the end of this loading arm and we measure the displacement of the lid with a um, displacement transducer and what will happen is we can, the sample thickness will decrease over time. So it will do something like this. So we stick our first load on and the sample thickness will decrease. Eventually it will stop decreasing. Um, and we measure the, the thickness of the sample at that point. We can at that point stick a, another load on. So this is our second load. We stick a, an, another mass onto, the, onto the, the loading arm and the sample will do something similar again. It will decrease in thickness until it will plateau. And we do that um, several times so we've loaded our, our sample and it's uh, decreased in thickness um, and we measure the thickness at each, point, each of those points, H2, NH3, etc. Now if we take that information, so we take the, the, the thicknesses of the sample um, at different loading increments, what we can uh, do is draw another graph that looks like this, where we have sample thickness with stress. And we put, plot our, our data onto that, so we have our H naught H1. So the gradient of this line 
is the change in sample thickness or delta rate or settlement with the change in stress. So the gradient of this line is equal to uh, delta H over change in stress. Now if we take that gradient um, and we divide it by the um, the initial sample thickness, H0, what we're actually left with is the MV value, so the um, coefficient of volume compressibility, which equals change in H over change in stress times H0. So from this, uh, from the gradient of this line, we can derive the MV value, but you can see that actually the gradient of the line isn't constant, so it changes or becomes more shallower um, with higher loading increments. And that uh, tells us something quite interesting about MV value, is that the um, the soil is more susceptible to um, to consolidation when we start loading or when we have our initial loading increments than um, le uh, than later loading increments or, or, or higher stresses and what 's happening there is our soil is becoming stiffer so with higher and higher loading increments, our soil is becoming less and less susceptible to consolidation. If we want to derive a, an MV value from this, this, this test, what we need to do is specify the, the load increments that that MV value is taken from. So we, if we took a, an MV value from, say, here, so we have our change in uh, stress and change in sample thickness, um, that, and then we call that H delta H1 and delta sigma 1, that will have a different value from if we took it over here, delta H2 and delta sigma 2. So when we're calculate, taking our MV value from this graph, we need to specify the loading increment. So to overcome that um, change in MV value with changing stress increments, one way to get around it is to um, take the log of the stress, um, or I should say that we're talking about effective stress. So each of these loading increments, um, we assume that the pore water is dissipated out, so the, the stress that we apply to the lid is actually the, becomes the effective stress within the sample. So we're talking about um, the log of effective stress here. So if we take the log of effective stress um, and we plot void ratio. So instead of sample thickness, we're, uh, we're now looking at void ratio, which is what we're really interested in when we're talking about um, uh, uh, soils. We're, we're looking at the changes in the void. So if we plot void ratio against log effective uh, stress, that curved line uh, transforms itself into a straight line. Um, and this is called the normal compression line. Or the normal consolidation line. Or the virgin consolidation line. It's given a whole range of different names. But um, it's the relationship between void ratio and the log of effective stress. Um, and that is a straight line. Um, so we can um, take the gradient of it, or the gradient remains constant. It will be constant now, um, but it will be the change in void ratio over the change in log effective stress. And that's equal to uh, the compression index, or CC. So where MV, um, your MV value changes with the stress increment, your CC or your compression index doesn't, it stays constant. Um, so it can be more useful to use your compression index when we're talking about consolidation, although the calculation for doing that is a little bit more complex. So calculating your void ratio during your odometer test um, becomes a little bit complicated. Um, so to do that, we need to go back and use the um, 
the calculations uh, or the formulae that we used to define um, void ratio and specific volume um, and how that then relates to things that we can measure within a test. So um, it's typical that what we do in an odometer test is once our uh, test is finished, we um, measure the, the mass of the sample. So we take the mass of the sample and we know the volume of the, um, the, uh, the sample as it sat in the, in the confining ring. So we know its height and the, um, the diameter of the confining ring. So we can work out the volume. We can work out what the density of the sample is or the bulk density of the sample is. Now, we've taken the, the bulk density. Um, we measure the water content, so we take our sample at the end of the test and we dry it in the oven and we measure the water content that's in the sample, so we get W. Um, and we also measure its specific gravity, so we take um, uh, a subsample of that material and we uh, measure the specific gravity. So from the bulk density, the water content and the specific gravity, we can derive the specific volume and the void ratio. So we can get that at the, the end of the test. If we try to do that at the beginning of the test, we'll end up disturbing the, the sample of soil um, and that will affect our test results. So it's best to do that at the end and then calculate the void ratio um, backwards through the test. And to do that, uh, we're assuming one-dimensional consolidation. So that makes things a little bit easier. So what that means is that, I'll just make some space here. One-dimensional consolidation means that um, the change in sample height, or delta H, over the initial sample height is equal to the change in void ratio over the 1 plus the initial void ratio. <laughs> so if we have the void ratio at the end of the experiment, and we can assume that that's the initial. I know it's maybe a, a bit of a misnomer, but let's say um, we're working backwards in time. So we take our, an initial void ratio um, to be the void ratio at the end of the experiment. Um, we know the thickness at the end of the experiment, so H0 in this case, and we know the change in thickness. So what this really is saying is that the, the change in sample thickness uh, through the experiment um, is equal to the change in void ratio or is a relationship between the change in void ratio. So for each um, change in sample thickness we can get a change in void ratio and we add that to the, um, the, the void ratio at the end of the experiment. So we can go um, uh, through, uh, back through our experimental results and de derive the void ratio at each one of these loading increments.